Hey, dudes. Amber Lee Frost here. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of me, but for a while, I was a co-host on Chopo Trap House. Uh, possibly the least favorite one. Um, but I wrote a book, finally, that is coming out December 5th. Uh, and if you, like many people, cannot read anything longer than like a post, I have good news for you too. I recorded the audiobook. I did it with my own voice, which uh, authors don't usually do because our voices are terrible sounding. But they thought, hey, you have a recognizable terrible sounding voice. And I cannot argue with that. So I can't promise you that I'm the best reader of an audio book, but I can promise you that I was the most stoned reader. I mean, I would bet dollars to donuts and I'm talking like edibles. I did not want to know how I sounded. It was a lot of pressure. I think it turned out great based on what other people are telling me. So I know you guys like content, right? So think of this as a really long episode of Chapo, but like read by your least favorite host, stoned out of her gourd. I think you will like the book. Um, if you don't, I will not hear about it, but it will at least be interesting. Uh, and hey, you know what? Worst case scenario, the book does well. It pisses off a bunch of people you don't like. And sometimes spite is all we have in this world. So yeah, uh, wherever you get books, get that book. Uh, it's called Dirtbag, the essays. And yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being patient while I um, went on a spirit journey. All right, thanks. Bye. Friends, it's your shot boat. It's Monday, November 13th. We are back at you again. Felix and I are joined today by Amber Frost. Amber, how you doing? I'm doing good. Um, L.A. caught on fire recently. I don't know if you read about that. L.A.'s on fire right now? I mean, like, okay. there's just, like, a road. Oh, I saw a guy saving pigeons on an L.A. freeway. On, on Aww, on that's so sweet. Yeah, they were, like, they, they fell down. They got smoke inhalation, and he was just grabbing them up. But, I mean, I think he could be hoarding them to use as, you know, couriers or something. I, I don't know. All right. Um, to, to kick off today's show, I would like to discuss two news items that I neglected to mention on last week's show. Uh, one of them has a news hook that just happened uh, today. Uh, the first of which is, uh, let's go with a more contemporary story. Uh, Tim Scott dropped out of the Republican presidential race. Uh, and this was only after finally revealing who his girlfriend is. So he's now out of the race to spend more time with his girlfriend, whose name is... Mindy Nose, an interior decorator from South Carolina. He hmm. he said he dropped out to like combat anti-Semitism on college campuses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he says here, um, Scott said some rivals wanted to draw attention to his marital status to sow the seeds of doubt about his campaign, according to the Washington Post. It's like a different form of discrimination or bias, Scott said. You can't just say I'm black because that would be terrible. So you find something else that you can attack. Yeah. Everyone remembers that awful chapter of American history when police unleashed fire hoses on guys who didn't have girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he like he, he, he really did say that he, he he's like, all right, silly season's over. I know I'm not getting this president <laughs> shit because I had sex when I was 37 and no other time in my life. But the real mission starts today combating anti-semitism at columbia like that's yeah. a, like you know how like wh whenever like a politician loses and they're like i didn't we didn't actually lose tonight because the fight begins to blah 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 he really means it he's really like um he, he's really gonna go to college campuses and make speeches i know i applaud senator scott for joining the war on college yeah i mean we yeah. can agree on that at least but is he just like I don't know, hanging out on the quad or whatever, just like waiting for people to walk by. Like, I don't know if like a lot of people are going to host him. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I think he's like given up on college as an idea, 
you know, the place where you get laid. Like he's tried that. Right. He's right. just I think this is a way for him to get invited on birthright. <laughs> well, I, he just wants I, a Mediterranean I, vacation. Yeah, exactly. I'd like to hear what Mindy knows thinks about him going on birthright. I mean, I, I mean <laughs> is she allowed to attend? And also Mindy knows uh, like, I mean, I'm going to need a follow up on their relationship like six months from now. That's all I'm saying. Mm hmm. Wow. Mindy knows uh, looks like one of those women on TikTok who like makes you know spaghetti o casserole like all those disgusting <laughs> viral meals like making kool-aid in the toilet and stuff like that yeah did you put it in the chat because i'm only coming up with like uh mindy collings got a nose job that would be funny if we were wrong and he's actually dating mindy Colling. <laughs> it's uh, the the cory booker move for the republican party yeah Worked for okay him. i am sending you mindy nose i do like the idea though that um Sing, like uh like bachelors are being discriminated against and like and I'm I'm thinking back to like uh Felix you brought up the civil rights movement when you know uh like peaceful protesters being attacked. I'm imagining men with like you know the placards that they had in the civil rights movement that say that said I am a man. I'm just imagining now one that says I am a single man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah, I um I don't know. Like uh best of luck to Senator Scott in the future. Mindy knows is like like I don't even know what she thought she was going to get out of this, but she's pretty hot. She's also like a uh, a mother of three. But I do kind of wonder if like he does have a little sense of like it being like discrimination and like, you know, if that's the case, he picked the wrong party. Maybe he is avoiding avoiding uh, raising those alarms. Oh, man. Think how fucking racist you would have to be to be a Republican and be like, I'm afraid of the virile savage Tim Scott <laughs> <laughs> f- fucking or fucking doing birth of the nation shit to us. Like that's it. Like if you're terrified of Tim Scott, you are just you're like medically racist. There's no help for you. <laughs> no amount of Ibrahim Kendi books are going to do anything for you. Um, so, yeah, she is pretty. She looks pretty good. I do wonder about that. Like she has three kids. Um, what kind of conversation is that? to have with your kids where you're like all right you may have a new stepfather i'm his second girlfriend ever <laughs> <laughs> your stepfather is a 60, like a 63 year old who's never jacked off <laughs> well uh Amber, i mean you, you asked like what what mindy got out of this and i think the answer to the question is a trip to the third republican presidential debate in which she appeared on stage with tim scott uh, at the closing of the proceedings. <laughs> she, she was certainly walking better in heels than uh, Ron DeSantis was. Yeah, I mean, everyone's going to want her to to decorate their weird North Carolina house or wherever the fuck she's from. I mean, it's a bummer because I was hoping, I mean, I was hoping Tim Scott could, you know, finally get finally get some action. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, getting laid is, you know, uh, that's something you have to do to get become president. And uh, unfortunately, that's not going to be him. Uh, Mike Pence also dropped out. Uh, there was an article about how he couldn't get um, even f- 15 people to show up to the uh, the pizza ranch in Ohio to come hear him talk. I thought that was the Indiana Mike Pence one. will also be exiting the Republican primary. I thought that was, oh, was in Indiana. Indiana sorry. Me. Yeah. But it was also like, OK, it was like a 7000 people town in the Midwest. The pizza's not good. Like they're not like, you know, we don't like that food either. We just were alcoholics and like, you know, Schlitz is the best sauce. They're not going to like eat there during the daytime. That's a that's a late night sadness meal. <laughs> any any meal where you have to listen to Mike Pence talk is a is a sadness meal. True. Uh, the next story that I neglected to mention uh, last week is uh, one that concerns um, the new Republican Speaker of the House, uh, Mike Johnson. Headline: Mike Johnson admits he and his son monitor each other's porn intake in resurfaced video. What do they mean, monitor? I mean, presumably they're gooning together. <laughs> <laughs> Keep gooning, Dad. Don't come yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I I mean, I think a system system like that of mutual accountability is great because whether it's working out or gooning, you know, I know I couldn't see, like I couldn't bring myself to stop jacking off if my son was still going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and during an eight hour gooning sesh, you're going to want to check in with your dad 
uh, th this is how this is how they monitor it, Amber. It says, uh, during a conversation on the war on technology at Benton, Louisiana's Cypress Baptist Church, unearthed by Twitter user Receipt Maven last week, the Louisiana representative talked about how he installed accountability software called Covenant Eyes on his device <laughs> in order to abstain from internet porn and other unsavory websites. Quote, it scans all the activity on your phone, on your devices, your laptop, what have you. We do it all. We, we do all of it, Johnson told the panel about the app. It sends a report to your accountability partner. My accountability partner right now is Jack, my son. He's 17. So he and I get a report about all the things that are on our phones, all our devices once a week. If anything objectionable comes up, your accountability partner gets an immediate notice. I'm proud to tell you, my son has got a clean slate. Now, you'll notice he doesn't mention that he had a clean slate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, do as, <laughs> yeah. Do as I say, not as I do. His son's phone is blowing up with like 30 Slack notifications, you know, like that, that buzzing noise. It's just like your dad just watched Gianna Michaels Big Naturals Volume 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh man, his poor son is trying to like, is trying to like try out for the JV football team and his phone is just exploding your dad has been watching Fuck Team 5 for the last five hours. <laughs> but also, like, you name your kid Jack, that's setting him up for failure. That's nominative determinism. I mean, I, I just, like, monitoring a father, it's just, like, fa a father and son masturbation monitoring is one of the weirder, one of the weirder things. And, like, okay, it'd be one thing if, the, the if, as, as a dad, as a parent, you're like, I'm, I want to enforce a no, a no, a no pornography on, on my son's phone, or you want to enforce that rule in your household as best you can. But the idea that you have to enlist your son to back you up is right, like, what the fuck? The you're, the, you're, 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 the, you're the goddamn Potter's Familius. If you want to watch, if you want to watch Lisa Ann, then go for it, dude. <laughs> why, do you, why didn't you enlist your teenage son in this? Oh, yeah. How old is he? The son is 17 years old. Oh, that's way past the, yeah. I mean, really just like any age. I, that's just, that's not part of the son contract, like helping he, your dad not jack off. Yeah, I, I don't like know. <laughs> I just feel like, I feel like the older it is, the worse it is because it becomes less about parental monitoring. So like, you know, your son doesn't develop a, you know, fetish for women vomiting on dicks. But like 17 is like, he's of a, age where uh having sex could actually happen and that's when you really yeah, gotta but that's when you really gotta hard back out yeah yeah and it's like do you think it's like an aa sponsor type thing where he like, <laughs> you have to call like with, when you when you relapse right. you get <laughs> coins. Right, right yeah right right yeah like the son is with a girl or something and he's like uh <laughs> showing her like his favorite chain smoker song or whatever <laughs> And like they're making out on, you know, make out lane, which I presume they still have where Mike Johnson yeah. lives. That's the that's the Biden infrastructure bill is to make more uh, make out points. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's on the build back better make out lane. Uh, and it's like he's about to get to third base and then he gets a frantic call from his dad. He's like, son, I'm chipping. <laughs> I've had my hand on my, I had my hand down my sweatpants for the last hour. It started. I first, it started off. It started off with the Victoria's Secret lingerie model bowl. Now I'm, yeah. Now now I'm watching like uh, Andrew Tate's Cam Girl Slaves. I got I gotta like go to a meeting, but I'm like really tired right now. You know, you know, like, I feel like like. His son's getting bothered with this shit, like uh, 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 accountability alert. Your father just uh, just watched a, a desperate college student. He really needs an A. But like he's yeah. he he's he's on the build. He's at the build back better make out lane. This hand <laughs> job brought to you by Joe Biden. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Joe. He's getting real pussy. And then his, his dad's annoying him with this accountability bullshit. Well, it, I don't know. It's also bad if you're just like, I don't know, like in trig class or whatever the fuck he's in like is it better or worse to be because i'm putting you know what i think a gentleman puts his phone on silent when you're at make out point i think that's good etiquette yeah yeah <laughs> i mean even if you weren't getting horny dad alerts it's good etiquette i just like think about <laughs> if he like has a bully at school that's like my. Oh, that's like. Oh that's, like that's, that's like this kid has a bully at school. It's Dude. probably a girl like me in high school, 
and and it's ruthless. That is like an anxiety dream. Like you, you, oh my god, you, you, your bully is like bullying you, and <laughs> you have your you have your phone out, even though you should know better. The kind of the kinds of alerts that you get on your phone, it's calling you a gay wad and shit. They probably don't say gay wad anymore. It's probably some. I don't insult. think so, but it is it is yeah. definitely like a a five foot three girl like me in like doc martens calling you a father fucker <laughs> well, she, well like she doesn't she doesn't even know that yet like she's just bullying him for being like you know rod without a todd and then suddenly <laughs> yeah. she sees a huge banner notification on the phone where it's like your dad uh speaker of the house mike johnson has ejaculated four times today contact <laughs> oh. authorities <laughs> I, that would have been fucking Christmas Day for me. Oh my god! <laughs> I now imagine like you know you're, you're in a gooning sesh. You're scrolling around <laughs> through websites. You're you're getting increasingly torqued up, looking at weirder and weirder shit. And then you get a pop up, and it's Mike Johnson's face, and it goes. It says, "New Speaker of the House does not want debt deal. They only want to come. Please, can you help him?" <laughs> <laughs> You get to watch his trajectory. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Is like it starts out Lisa Ann and then it ends up like Ray Lil Black doing real uh hentai. It's just like it's like he's gotten into the visual like uh like the tube porn, like the the egg impregnation stuff. Because it is it's I think for men it's a slippery slope. Eventually they just they glaze over and they're like, you know what? This doesn't do it regular sex doesn't do it for me anymore. I'm going I'm going straight to to animation. I'm doing I'm going like he's probably it doesn't count for like deviant art. Does it count with like, you know, you see like all of the Steven Universe people fucking each other? Like it's gonna like there's porn is to be found in many mediums these days. That is true. Yeah. And I imagine especially like younger people are getting into a lot of the animated stuff. I yeah. I, I just like with the app itself, I'm wondering like how who created this in the first place and i'm starting to think it was like a stepdad who was like grooming his 13 year old stepson I mean, and yeah, the mom yeah, yeah. the mom like walked in on him like show, showing the stepson porn and he's like ah oh uh, uh we're uh this is part of a mutual accountability exercise i'm actually yeah. making an app about the, about this i mean the apps the app the name of the app is like short eyes it's Co covenant eyes <laughs> it's not too far oh, off. God, yeah. No. This was yeah, this, <laughs> Or this you know what? Like oh, a... wait. Wait, maybe it's the other th direction. Maybe it's like uh the strange thing about the Johnsons. Wait, what's that? What's that? Oh my god. Uh it's uh you know what? Okay. Early days of come town. St that's that's your hint. It's dad fucking. Like what if oh, it's like okay. a reverse oh, thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. What if the kid is the aggressor? We don't know the power dynamics in this relationship. <laughs> oh my god! All right. imagine, what if the dad imagine. is the is the unwilling bottom? <laughs> oh my god! Oh god, could you could you imagine if that's like yeah, that's like his Gary Hart moment that he got like aggressively seduced by his son. <laughs> <laughs> the mom, the mom, just, the mom <laughs> is just in the other room doing dishes crying being like it's fine it's fine it's fine because she's gotta know right yeah uh, yeah you can't moms know everything like think rana rana mcdan uh, rana rana Ron, fucking stupid name rana romney mcdaniel i fucking <laughs> the chair of the rnc that. I love that so much. I love that it's like the most Mormon ass name in the world. Like, like they love doing that where they're like, yeah, my, my dad's name was David. So my name is David Etta. They're the most like Erzots religion, but she's kind of a, like a, like a, yeah. like a tr trailblazer too, though. Like, she, cause like she's bucking the stick. Like everyone thinks, everyone thinks that all Mormons are hot and like there she is bucking oh, the yeah. stereotype. Hard, Buck -tooth yeah. The stereotype, yeah, yeah. She has more of like a Sarah Huckabee look, but like she has to go on TV and be like, "Look, Mike Johnson's a victim here. I know how this looks." <laughs> but like, uh, a photo of Mike Johnson and son emerges on Johnson's yacht, gooning business. 
Gooning, <laughs> <laughs> uh. G-O-O-N-I-N-G. It means basically uh, being transfixed with porn, video porn, for like 24, 48 hours straight. Uh, straight's the right word there. All right. Well, uh, to move on from the uh, masturbatory habits of the current Speaker of the House and his family, uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Donald Trump for a little bit. And uh, Chris, can we can we cue up that clip? Because I, I just want to talk about like Trump. He's been saying some very provocative things lately, but he's also been saying some very true things lately. And I just want to pull, pull up this clip about Trump talking about a certain world historical figure that I think will be of some interest to our listeners. And we're becoming a drug haven. You know, China many years ago was being taken over by much smaller countries because they were all <laughs> drugged out on the poppy fields, the poppy, the drugs, heroin, different drugs, but they were all drugged out. The nation was drugged out. And then along came a very <laughs> powerful leader. You know who that is? And he said, no more. And from that time, pretty much until now, they... Uh, They've been strong, but they were all drugged out, and uh, they were, I mean, our nation's becoming that way, <laughs> okay? Our nation's becoming that way. You look at our nation, it's, uh, that you almost say, how does it survive when so many people are absolutely sick from drugs and drug overdose and all of the things that go with it? Well, uh, that is... Trump Trump is correct that uh, this country is suffering from an epidemic of drug addiction, but he is even more correct that we need a strong leader like Comrade Mao Zedong to uh, basically defeat all of the um, counter-revolutionary revisionism that's been going on in this country. Sparrows have been running riot over this nation for a long time now, and I think it's time we need to... i like, no more. No yeah. more. No more, no I mean, more it does, poppies. It does speak to his, like, pattern of, like, he just... He doesn't have any, like, ideological leanings. He just wants it both with the Israel Palestine thing. He's waiting it out. He wants to see who wins. He likes a strong man. It is, you know, the content is completely irrelevant. But I have to say, one person pointed out that, like, the phrase drugged out, the last time he heard it was uh, the Juicy J song. And so, like, we're kind of wondering if he's <laughs> into, like, early 2010s rap. Folks, well, folks, they're saying they're saying we're gonna, folks. Should I do it? I shouldn't. They say I shouldn't do it, but yes, we're gonna do it. We're gonna run a train, folks. We're running a train. <laughs> <laughs> he um he was very generous to the audience, being like, you know who Mao is. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 like like, I, is... I, 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 like did, did the audience think he was talking about Hitler or something? I mean... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna insult I, I... your. I'm not gonna insult your intelligence. They know he wasn't talking about Hitler because the main thing about Hitler. Uh, you know, speedhead, speedhead. You don't give those speeches. Oh, you're right. You're not, he wasn't if you're into not, like, if You're not doing as much Adderall as a as a New York girl in publishing. That's what happens. Those bitches are going to take over Poland any day now. Did you see the? I think it was from the same speech. He said that, like, uh, he was talking about uh, G again, and he said he's straight out of central casting. <laughs> he loves him. <laughs> like, he loves him. <laughs> he's almost central, as handsome as Tom Cruise. Ca central yeah. casting for what? Like a 68-year-old Chinese man? <laughs> like he's, there aren't that many parts for in, in central casting. There's basically one actor in Hollywood who plays above 50 Chinese men. Yeah, I I do like the idea of like him trying to do the cultural revolution, but with like only 60-plus-year-olds. Yeah, he doesn't have a, a, a youthful cadre. Yeah, and like really queeny, really queeny, like 60 plus. <laughs> and he is a tastemaker. Like, I really bet that like he got a lot of like Midwestern dads who sell skidoos to to watch Sunset Boulevard. You know, in many ways, he's he's like he's doing more than PBS for the culture right now. <laughs> Felix, uh, I'm, I'm loving the idea of a MAGA cultural revolution where uh, grandparents attack their grandkids and put iron dunce caps on them and make them walk, <laughs> sort of parade them through the villages on, the, on golf carts or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. It, it, it's all like uh, self-criticism and ostracization for uh, reactionary grandkids who don't call their grandparents enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like wow. filial piety would be a good thing to run on. Like he's 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 attracting the elderly. They they just want their grandparents. They just want their grandkids to call him. 
you know, I think we figured out those are the only people that vote. It's a good strategy. Yeah. yeah wow. I mean, wow. You're, you're telling me this for the first time. I'm hearing this for the first time. A people's army will never be defeated. Never be defeated. Not even once. Not going to happen. <laughs> I did. I, I liked um, the stuff he said about uh, Israel and Palestine because that, actually, was, that, like, that was more that was more even handed than just about any media figure discussing this. Where he said uh, the hatred that Palestinians have for Israelis is a hatred like no other. And also the other way from Israelis towards Palestinians. It's, it's good. He's hedging his bets. It's both sides. He's, he just wants to, he's like, I'm going to see how this shakes out. He said, and it's probably the other way. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> like, like, like maybe he's like Noah Smith and he's finding out about all this yeah. for the first time. <laughs> yeah. like, uh, he uh, did. I think he's the only American politician who has pointed out that Israel is eating shit on the PR front. Yeah, and I mean, it's very, well, he's the only person who's like, it's bad optics, and it's like, that is the weird thing that, like, Felix and I have talked about, that it's like, they're still very delusional in that they think that, like, and and it's our fault, too, in some degree, like, and to some degree, the UK. It's like, we have spent so much time being the Gretchen Wieners to their Regina George that, like, of course they think they're delusional. Of course they think they're they are beloved. They're like living in a bubble where just they have they think that uh, any criticism of them is like an insane minority opinion. And like they do not see that yeah. like the tides are turning. It's the weirdest thing. I think me and Felix talk about this, too. Like it's not something we thought we'd see in our lifetime. No, not at all. And like most politicians, right? Like, you know, not all of them are as like literally due to mental disability trapped in the past as Joe Biden is. But in one way or the other, they all are in some sense on Israel, right? Like yeah. every every elected official in this country, save for maybe like three, believes that it's 2002. Like yeah. that's their entire calculus on Israel that like there's a broad like people don't really know about it. Um, the people that do care have like a broadly supportive opinion but also that like there's this level of Israeli competence that just it doesn't exist anymore. But in their minds, it does. And that factors into their calculus in all of this. But like, I don't know how like it's been a month. And like, did you see the thing that Israel tried like yesterday? The Mein Kampf book <laughs> in the children's living room. That was stupid. But there's an even dumber thing. They produced like a piece of paper. And it was like Arabic writing on one side and Hebrew on the other. And they're like, this is a, a, a phrase book that Hamas was practicing. They were learning phrases in Hebrew. And one of them was <laughs> learning how to say in Hebrew, take off your pants to women. So you could see that proves they were doing tons of rapes. Well, and look, it, that's just that's in Duolingo. Like, you need to know how to say that. <laughs> yeah, that little yeah. owl t told me how to say that in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like obviously Arabic speakers like ripped it apart because the grammar was all fucked up. Like, I don't know how the Israeli army doesn't have fluent I, Arabic speakers. No, they're, probably, it's, it's, they're like, probably using babblefish, like not even a good like no, that, uh, that's literally what it's like. They one of the phrases is on there in the phrase book was they wanted apparently they want people to believe that Hamas was trying to learn the phrase. How do I drive a tank in Hebrew? <laughs> who would they ask that to yeah, the, felix the fucking dmv that's uh, that's obvious <laughs> well uh felix you say that but it, it's to communicate with the merkava's onboard autopilot system <laughs> yeah 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 no they uh were learning all the phrases like please turn on yellowstone <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to watch 1923. Yeah. You know, like the, the whole, the, all the Hamas documents were outlining all of the uh, Taylor Sheridan shows, and they're like, uh, "Attention, Kassam brigades! Yellowstone 1923 is different than Yellowstone, which is also different than Yellowstone 1888." Please make sure <laughs> yeah. to have this information handy. It is very crazy that they're like actual. They've been spending so much time and money, well, our money, like militarizing, and they're like really, really super bad at it. Like it's it's it's, it's uh, you, like you guys invented ways and now you can't figure out how to fucking land a rocket not on your own hospital like a fucking like 
Looney Tunes, like a fucking Tex Avery cartoon. Yeah, yeah. They uh, for people who don't know, an Iron Dome rocket, basically, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was biblical. This was like something it was, where it's it like, a- if you see this happen to your country, God is mad at you. It was heading to intercept a rocket coming from Gaza, and it literally did a fucking U turn and slammed <laughs> and slammed back. Uh, it was into like, was it a hospital? Was it a hospital or like a, an office building in Tel Aviv? I can't remember it, but it was it was deeply it was deeply like you know slipping. It's like Israel is like uh, holding the the soup terrain of like turtle soup and like steps on a roller skate that lands on a banana peel and spills it all over the dowager countess. It was just like such a like bumbling fucking Marx Brothers move. Yeah. And like going back to Trump, I mean, like, obviously he was like one of the most like pro-Israel presidents we've ever had. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem, which I do have to point out. Hillary Clinton was saying that she wanted to do that back in 1997. So this is, you know, it's a bipartisan thing, but he also, he doesn't have the same like mystique around Israel that like people who have been in politics for all their lives have. Right. Because he can smell a loser. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like Joe Biden or even someone younger, like Hakeem Jeffries, they have been trained to think of Israel as like, you know, they can, they can defeat any enemy in a week. It may not look pretty, but they'll get it done. They're super competent. Don't worry, they'll they'll tar and feather all their enemies through their sophisticated press operation. Like you are not going to look bad supporting this. Don't worry. And like obviously that isn't the case anymore, but good luck telling these guys that. But Trump, who, you know, coming more from the outside, believes a lot of the same stupid shit about Israel, but doesn't have the same, you know, institutional dogma, I guess. And yeah, can can kind of can kind of evince some loserdom coming out right. of Israel. It doesn't mean anything. If he was president, he would um, probably enact the same incredible, like incredibly Zionist policy. But it is it is interesting that he said that, though, right? I think it's, I mean, like with many things, I think he can get away with saying things that like uh, breach the boundaries of like consensual reality in this country, particularly on Israel, because he is probably the most popular political figure in the world in Israel. And I don't think there's much he could do to shake them from their support of him. Uh, yeah. But as long as we're talking about the uh, the PR war here, I was um, inspired by our, our mutual friend who's been keeping a running list of all of the Hasbara meltdowns over the last month or so. And I just decided to try to keep a running count myself this week uh, since our last episode. And I'm just going to run down the list of what I have. Um, we, we can talk about them like, you know, wh- wh- whichever one that you, you feel compelled to uh, discuss. But OK, we had uh, a running of a very old script at the beginning of the week, which is the Pallywood script. The idea that um, all of the, uh, the, you know, ruined bodies and crying people that you see in news footage are, in fact, actors. They're crisis actors. And like they shared some clip from a Lebanese movie that was made about Gaza that seemed to show them like victims having makeup put on and stuff like that. Uh, th- once again, that bricked almost instantly because like f- footage of this behind the scenes footage was included on like the DVD of the movie when it came out. So it was pretty yeah, obvious. Yeah, it had the bloopers. From- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody <laughs> loves bloopers. Shoe- shoebox credit running with the, the outtakes <laughs> from the, uh, from the latest bombing campaign. But yeah, I mean like th- this one is so crazy because like they're like saying, Oh, like uh, none of our victims are actually victims. They're acting but we are dropping thousands of bombs where they live. That was replaced almost immediately with, as soon as that one bricked, the next one was uh, all our victims are real people, but they're also Nazis. And also the Nazis weren't that bad. (laughs) Yeah. That one's fucking crazy. That that, like their, their line about this now is like, well, look like uh, the Nazis were bad and killed Jews, but they at least knew to be ashamed of it. What? When were they ashamed of? It? <laughs> yeah. The fuck. I mean, presumably because they tried to hide the final solution. Or yeah, I feel like it was like rolled out with a PowerPoint presentation, like in a room with yeah. fucking diet cokes. They they were very proud of that shit. Um, but yeah, no. In in the it was an article that ran in the Jerusalem Post by this guy Douglas Murray, 
And his point was, and I literally, there's a, there's a the line in the article where he says, the Nazis still had, quote, a spark of humanity in them, unlike Hamas. And also <laughs> every single man, woman, and child in the Gaza Strip is Hamas. So they went from saying, none of our victims are actually victims, they're crisis actors, to all of our victims are victims, but they're all Nazis, but also the, they're worse than the Nazis. This does have the ring of, like, the, the anti-Semites being like, look, the Holocaust didn't happen, but uh, if it did, it was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, yeah, it's it, yeah. exactly that. Exactly. Like, that is, that is like, the Turkish line on the Armenian genocide a lot of the time. Like, <laughs> yeah. it, it didn't happen, but it was good that we did it. <laughs> like, it's, I guess the, um, the the dog eared Hitler book, the dog eared copy of Mein Kampf was part that was of the this next one strategy. Yeah, no, yeah. They're, they're, they're both they're bolstering the Nazi. And the same week that like the official organs of like the Jerusalem Post and like the uh, mouthpieces for this massacre are saying, hey, the Nazis are pretty bad, but Hamas was worse because they're proud of what they're doing, whereas the Nazis felt ashamed by it. And, you know, after they spent a day shooting people into a ditch, they often felt bad for bad about themselves. I don't know. Like, once again, like, I feel like a lot of this propaganda, like their wires are crossed and there's no like coherent media message here because then it was what the president of Israel, uh, Herzog, came out, produced a book an Arabic translation of Mein Kampf that, as you said, Felix, was dog-eared and filled with like post-it notes and highlighted sections that he said was taken <laughs> from, quote, a children's living room in the Gaza Strip. And it's like weird <laughs> enough that like they're bringing out a, a, a book, a, a book to be like, see, like, see, they're Nazis. Like, you know, this justifies what we're doing. But the phrase in a children's living room struck me as like, uh, I mean, I know English isn't their first language, but I mean, like, I, I was struck by the idea like children's living room because it seemed to imply that like children were reading this book and that's why it's okay that we're killing them. But it also could could imply if anyone called them on that, that this was just uh, an adult or a Hamas fighter had left his favorite book in the child's living room where they were, uh, you know, attacking people from. So that's why it's okay that we blew it up. Yeah, Maybe they're yeah. still thinking that they have their own version of like kibbutzes where there's like a, just like a big group parenting situation. It's like, that's the children's living room. Yeah. It's like they're doing an evil Montessori class in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do, I do like like the the dog eared pages and like that like like it's like a you know this this for editorial review uh maybe errors in it like the like the first review copies you get it was an yeah, advanced yeah. review copy <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah Hitler DM'd this Palestinian nine year old and was like do you wanna do you want a copy of my book I can send you galleys and the Palestinian <laughs> nine year old was like oh god that means I'm gonna have to have this guy on my show. <laughs> No, but it came from like okay. his publisher too, like a really chipper woman, like who works for Macmillan. Yeah, I didn't even know Hitler was still alive, and now I have to get him <laughs> on a Zoom call. Uh, you know, I, I will, I will point out though that when they displayed the cop, the Arabic translation of Mein Kampf, it was very clear that the previous, the pre, the prior owner of of the evil book did underline passages in pen. And for that alone, I think them and their family should be killed. But like, Psychopath. Well, what if uh, it was like now scarred? What if they just really like Scandinavian lips? <laughs> <That's my struggle, laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, like, well, it's a guy with a big beard on the front, you know? Ben Gavir is like reading aloud from it at, at the press conference under the presumption that it's like Hitler's <laughs> my struggle. And yeah. he's like, listen, listen to this Jew hating rhetoric. <laughs> there was a woman at a coffee shop who wasn't, she wasn't like the most beautiful woman in the world, but she had kind of like sort of a shapely body, a few pounds of weight. Um, and I think about the way that I've aged and whether or not I've been a good father. And that's, that's 500 pages. And they're like, this is yeah. so insidious. Yeah. They're like, this is, yeah, this is, this is a blueprint to hate. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up on the propaganda meltdowns, uh, we had that video from someone purporting to be a nurse in the Al Shifa hospital claiming oh that God. Hamas was uh, was was storing weapons there and taking away aid from the hospital workers. But like, I mean, I'm astonished, like th the credibility of this video lasted for about 10 seconds because like Felix, like you said, Israel loves to talk about all the Palestinians that are Israeli citizens. Could they get even one of them to star in these videos? Instead, they they they, they choose to highlight a woman who uh, graduated from the Gal Gadot School of Acting. And enough champagne 
to fill the Nile. Like, is there not <laughs> one person in the Israeli government who can like speak with a credible Arabic accent? Yeah, no, I mean, they can't speak in anything. Like, we pointed this out, but like in Wonder Woman, she was so bad at, she was so just unable to do like a, a flat, general, bland accent that every other actor there had to sound like her. It was like, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like they were like, well, fuck. She is making no progress. Could could you like professional actors do this? Yeah, like I'm not going to pretend like I can identify like when someone makes a mistake in Arabic. I tried to learn Arabic on Duolingo once like eight years ago. And it was I think I just I that's it's one of the of hardest brain, languages to speak. It's so fucking learn. hard. But yeah. but hearing this woman's accent, I do know what I I'm knew, hearing. I a knew fucking instantly. Israeli accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That yeah. fucking spit, that like uh, spitty French accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like this was the Professor Talks. Like, you guys don't know what this is. This is Professor Talks. If there are any homosexuals listening, they'll know what I'm talking about. One thing that I think is like, I don't know, it, it's puzzling with like, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, know what um list of has borrow fuck ups you're 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 reading from uh one thing that isn't on there because it's like too broad in general is like the quibbling over like intentionality that i think is really weird that's more because, of a meta like, breakdown that's yeah. a great right, it's a meta thing but it's like it, it's so weird to be because it's like okay if you've killed like 10 at least ten thousand civilians but you didn't mean to shouldn't that mean like okay you don't get to have a military anymore <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, like you're too you're way too shitty at this yeah i think in like you know there there was a big uh intentions don't matter movement in the uh in the 2010s like twitter discourse uh but the exception i mean i always disagree with that it, attentions attentions do matter unless like it, it involves mass death uh, yeah, like, I, I don't know, man. Like, that's one of those things where it's like, well, you're bad at this and you, you don't get to play with that anymore. You don't get to use the stove while mommy is gone. Yeah. If it's like we we're seeking to kill like these, let's say, like, you know, 40 guys uh, who are imported in Kassam brigades and Hamas at large. Whoops. We killed 6000 children. That should be like. Everyone comes in and takes away all of your fucking F sixteens. Like that's yeah. you can't play anymore. You're yeah, done. Like you, you give them the like, look, I'm not mad, but I am disappointed. Yeah. Uh next up on the rundown, we have um Ham Hamas's uh, uh use of fentanyl laced rockets. That Did you guys see this one? Yeah, fentanyl that rock they're, 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 incredible. Uh, uh, a source says that Hamas is considering launching fentanyl laced rockets into uh tel aviv this one is really devious because once the fentanyl rocket hits an army outpost the soldiers will leave their post and start stealing copper wiring <laughs> all throughout <laughs> israel so they can buy more i, I guess like where, where so we're and then and then just today before i got before i got online there because you know i mean like uh there have been uh, just absolutely blood curdling accounts of snipers shooting people in hospitals, like, you know, people in on gurneys and in wheelchairs getting shot in the throat with sniper. Wait, rifles. You need a sniper for that. How fucking stupid is your military? <laughs> if you see someone in a hospital bed and you have to, this is like pinning down like a, a 14 year old in paintball. Yeah. Um, so the, they're, they're having to release because they keep saying that like Hamas has these command centers at all these hospitals that they're shooting up. So that they've they finally gotten into one of these hospitals. I forget which one, but they have like, you know, some Israeli military spokesperson kitted out in the full gear. And his name is like Glav Hav or something like that. <laughs> Gore, oh, is it my Gore favorite my favorite guy? My favorite guy, uh, Jonathan Cornicus. <laughs> I don't know who he is, but he was basically walking around like they did. Of course, they, they didn't find any tunnels under the hospital. So essentially he was in like just a conference room of a hospital and pointed out that there were baby bottles, a, a makeshift toilet, and like uh, there's some papers around. They were like, see, he was like, see, this is where they were keeping the hostages. And we know that because there is a calendar on the wall that like that, um, uh, you know, explicates hostage taking duty. And then once again, people are like Arabic speakers who pointed out that this thing on the wall was literally just like a, a duty roster of uh, nurses at a hospital. Like it just said Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on it. <laughs> 
Why would you need to know the days of the week unless you're keeping hostages? Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> this has to be the least creative country that's ever. It's astounding. It's astounding. It's like, yeah. and, and Felix, I know you pointed this out, but it's just like, is, is it a product of the fact that they live in this total bubble with complete impunity so that they've never had to be smart or clever or creative? Or is it just like, this is what uh, imperial culture do, does to your brain? This is how lazy and stupid it makes you. Yeah, well, I think that too. And you know, you know my theory of, of climates. I, I, I just think you get a Mediterranean climate, you all eventually end up like Stav's grandmother or grandfather connected, collecting birds. Uh, and I think people sort of project <laughs> like um, what they think of American Jews on Israelis. Like, hey, my cardiologist is Jewish. Uh, you know, my daughter's roommate is a, is a real go-getter. Uh, and then, and then they don't understand that, like, when you move to Israel and are are born and raised there, you're you're just a Guido. Like yeah. these are yeah. these are not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are the Ashkenazi dominated parties are like they they all have names like Good Morning and like <laughs> Nice Handshake, <laughs> and they're like they're increasingly. Uh, increasingly marginal and voted like the people that vote for them are like you know a 72 year old who uh, has a name like an American Jewish guy and is like vaguely against settlements and the occupations but also killed like 400 Arabs in 1967 yeah and I think the like I think also the you know hamburger discotheque capri pants ones too yeah no the um the guidos run the country yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as long as you're talking about um, settlers, uh, the other the other big piece of propaganda fail this week was that they let one of these settlers talk to the New Yorker about what they believe in. Did you guys yeah, see that oh, interview? Yeah. <laughs> it's give just him, like yeah. give him enough rope. Yeah, and like, look, uh, ev- everyone loves giving Isaac Chonitor a pat on the head for um, again, like talking to this like sub mental moron. Um, but like, look, I think for his readership or the readership of the New Yorker, they probably don't they don't they don't encounter. Uh, the Israeli point of view that's just like, yeah, we're definitely colonizing Palestine and we need to kill them all for that to happen. Problem? Yeah. yeah. But here's the thing. Like, I would love Isaac Chonitor to do another one of his wry and knowing review, uh, interviews with, let's say, David Remnick, the editor-in-chief of The New Yorker. I mean, like, on what their yes. editorial policy is as regards Israel, because they just had a piece out two weeks ago that uh, basically accused Al Jazeera journalists of working with Hamas and con- contextualizing when their families are assassinated by the IDF. Yeah, it would be really fucked up if uh, a news outlet was in the pocket of a particular political institution. That would never happen here. And then, actually, my my favorite piece of propaganda fail this week was when the uh, Israeli government uh, accused the AP, Reuters, and the New York Times of having foreknowledge of the October 7th uh, attacks because they employed freelance photojournalists who worked with Hamas or something like that. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you. And I think this is actually a welcome development because if, look, the New York Times has been known to use human shields. And if Brett (laughs) Stevens is killed in an airstrike, it's simply an understandable and justifiable, not intentional, but justifiable act of war to to get at the the deep and, and highly complex network of tunnels underneath the island of Manhattan. Yeah. And I mean, like... It will stop when the New York Times journalists and, you know, photojournalists love their children more than they hate everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you knew how that was going to end. They love, they love their children uh, even more than they love the news. <laughs> they, like, that's one thing that I found, like, remarkable about Israel this g- go around is so, like, they get incredibly mad at places like the New York Times and like the BBC or wherever. Really, they've pretty much any mainstream outlet they've yelled at for one thing or another, right? But like, they don't seem to understand that in order for these places to be like effective, uh, like effectively sell their their agenda, they have to be seen as at least somewhat trustworthy. So they yeah. can't like. They can't just like, you know, print two contradictory things on back to back days like the Israeli press office is doing. So like, did, like yeah. it, they've already got the New York Times to print that Hamas uses hospitals as their command and control centers. So 
why why you would fuck that up by accusing them of being Hamas is beyond me. Well, there's also like this amazing like they they do that like quite a bit. I mean, they never really did a mea culpa on Iraq, but like they I mean, remember when they were like, uh, you know, myths of anti-Semitism in uh, in the in the Ukrainian military. And like yeah. two weeks later, they ran something that says uh, Nazi insignia on on uh, whatever Ukrainian military volunteers highlights thorny issues of Ukraine. <laughs> yes, I hate it when yes. I hate it when thorny <laughs> issues are highlighted. And that was That's like that was like two weeks. Part. It was like two weeks later. And and I don't. I, I read the second one, and I I like writers don't get to pick their titles, but he did like admit and kind of like sell out the bag and said well we did have these pictures earlier and didn't publish them they're just <laughs> okay. wearing they're just, just wearing right. like pointy eagles all over themselves and they're like mm, this is just this is just like you know russian propaganda <laughs> skull fans <laughs> pro prosper in the ukrainian volunteer force <laughs> the pointy e eagles do look cool it, it does suck that those are ruined um, so I guess, uh, where is all this going? And the answer comes um, in this uh, headline from Al Jazeera from just yesterday. Billionaires are teaming up for pro-Israel anti-Hamas media drive. The campaign is seeking million-dollar donations from dozens of the world's biggest names in media, finance, and tech, Semaphore reported. And it says here that they're, they're seeking to raise uh, $50 million to do another big pro-Israel anti-Hamas push. And I got to say, if... You're looking to outclout the money Hamas spends in the U.S. government and military. You're going to need to spend a lot more than $50 million, my friend, a lot more. But I just want to highlight one paragraph from this piece. Uh, this is under the subhead, Get Ahead of the Narrative. U.S. billionaire Barry Sternlicht, who started the project, said the campaign would help Israel, quote, get ahead of the narrative as the world reacted to the intensive Israeli <laughs> attacks in the Gaza Strip. Quote, Public opinion will surely shift as scenes, real or fabricated by Hamas, of civilian Palestinian suffering will surely erode Israel's current empathy in the world community, Sternlich wrote in an email soliciting contributions from wealthy figures shortly after Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel, according to Sem Semaphore. We must get ahead of the narrative. So two things here. One, as Amber, as you said earlier, he says, it will surely erode Israel's current empathy in the world community. What are you talking about, dude? Even before October 7th, nobody in the world fucked with you other than the United States, Canada, and the UK. Nobody. Yeah. And then this other thing. Yeah, yeah. This, is, uh, is, this is very Jack Donaghy, Six Sigma. Like, there's, there's like a yeah, millennial yeah. Like, coming <laughs> in with like, you know, fucking, you know, hey, we got free LaCroix in the lobby. Let me tell you, you need to remake your story and your brand. Like, this is the most, like, bullshit, like, consultancy firm just taking them for all they're worth. Which, I know, you know yeah, what? Yeah. Get it, get it. Get that money. But, I mean, I, I like the idea, like, uh, he says real or fabricated because they're like, look, the entire world is going to see uh, basically a nonstop flood of images of the thousands and thousands of people we're killing. But, like, so how do we get ahead of that narrative? We're certainly not going to stop killing them. But I just like the idea that, like, these people either really think or there are people still willing to take their money to convince them that this is true, that they can turn this ship around as it regards yeah. like the opinion of the world or the United States public at large. Like how what, what is the story? What is the narrative change that they're going to come up with? that's going to get people to go, oh, actually, it's quite justified what you're doing. It's going to involve some word like synergy or something like that. Like, it's just, I, this sounds like just such consultancy speak. I know. And like, I guess like the really yeah. cynical part of me knows that this is not actually about affecting world opinion or increasing empathy for Israel or their cause. I think like all of the examples I just listed of these grotesquely absurd and darkly hilarious, like these limp attempts to justify the mass murder that's going on is I don't think intended to change anyone's opinion or convince anyone of anything. I think it's intended to give the people who already support Israel something to say when people get mad at them or something to yeah. defend themselves with. But for the most part, I think it's intended to keep people like me and you uh, talking about how ridiculous. I mean, I guess I feel complicit in this. I, you know, I, I do the show. It's, it, this is what we talk about, but like, it's to get people to debate the specifics of um, can you really believe that they pointed to a calendar and said it was a terrorist plotting device in the hospital that they just blew up? Yeah, well, and it's and like just everything else, I'm sure I'm sure the people who run this are like the fail sons and daughters of 
actual professor professionals and they just started a consultancy firm and and consultancy firms make money no matter how bad their results are yeah <laughs> sort of yeah. similar to the israeli government <laughs> they keep getting money yeah. no matter how bad their results are they print that shit one thing that i think is interesting is okay so pretty much all of israel's um anything that they were competent at or showed any potency in uh, let's say 20 years ago has completely crumbled. Right. And um, from the looks of it, maybe it was never quite that good. I do wonder going forward what they're going to do with how the settler stuff is perceived in the West, because like we've talked about it before, but I think that for better or for worse, that is the greatest threat to them being treated like a normal country. Like, unfortunately, well, that and Amy Schumer. Well, the, I mean, you know, talk about um, who could imagine such gains for the Palestinian causes. <laughs> I never <laughs> yeah. imagined that. You know what? Maybe she's she's maybe she's co-intel pro. Maybe she's working with the Palestinians. That's what I think Piers Morgan is doing. Yeah. 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 It's like, look, I I'm going to do what I can and be the most annoying person in the world until everyone was just like, I believe whatever the opposite of what this woman is saying. Yeah. But, but like the settlement stuff is, you know, unfortunately, like when you kill fucking over 10,000 people in a month through airstrikes and artillery, like Western countries, even if it's like, you know, just done, somehow done to a worse scale than almost anything we've seen, they still like understand that, right? That's still, it's still like, okay, we do that. But like, heck, State sanctioned lynch mobs and like handing out ARs to settlers and just like I mean pertinent to the the um, interview with the settler, just the attitudes of the settlers is like you really can't make the argument that you're a normal country with those and, and like it, it, to 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 this point, it seems like their entire strategy with settlers and how they appear to you know every other country in the world is just to never talk about them. Right. And that's going to become increasingly harder. And I think that's why the Chanitor interview uh, hit people so hard is because, like, he just spoke to someone who doesn't have the guile or connections or even just wherewith or just even knowledge to know what you're supposed to say to the American media. Yeah. I yeah, mean, like, so, yeah. I mean, she just she just spoke truthfully about what she believes in, which I think is totally commonplace in Israel. But most people who get, you know, asked to be interviewed or put in front of a camera uh, know how to manage media like they're smart enough but, to like understand what a global community thinks about all of this so they have to couch it and say oh israel isn't an apartheid state most jews are actually slightly uh, dusky but there isn't like <laughs> but there isn't uh like a good version of the settler thing no, there isn't like there's there nothing like, you can say yeah no. right there, there, there isn't like a streamlined like slick way of saying any of that which unfortunately you kind of can do with with um like conventional military operations like obviously yeah. they're way shittier at selling that than they used to be and you know the the trend isn't looking good for them but there's like there's never been any way that they could sell the settler thing to the rest of the world without like everyone realizing how not normal a country they are there's it's impossible it's too fucking weird there's just like the only thing they could possibly do with that is say like, oh, well, uh, you guys had, you know, you guys like um, killed Native Americans, which is like, that's just like throwing up your hands and walking out of the room. That's if, if think about like yeah. if Portugal brought back slavery like and they were like, well, what you guys did it like no one would accept that. <laughs> I think they did well in terms of PR for a long time just because they they kept kind of a low profile like they they now they're insisting upon themselves. But like, you know, when I was growing up, it, it was just like, you know, uh, evangelical TV being like, buy an olive tree for Israel. Like and then when you really just give them you're, like you're not supposed to give them the microphone. Like you have to control, yeah. you have to limit their public exposure. Uh, they have to be a little discreet. And they're like, people are doing bad things to us. This is dangerous. And they're like, oh shit, I'm sorry. That, that blows. Uh, 
we like you. We don't what have the Jews well back. That's a real big bummer. But once they get like a full on like propaganda press team on it, you're like, oh, you're insane. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Exactly. And I think what we're seeing right now is the equivalent of like someone who's been playing a video game with a cheat code for the last 70 years. And now the cheat code isn't working anymore. And they're throwing the <laughs> controller. Yeah. 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 And, like, the cheat code is unlimited U.S. support. But, like, I think we're seeing, like, how tenuous that is. I mean, look, they have the entire government behind them and will so will continue to do so for, into the future. But, like, cracks are beginning to emerge in a way that I think none of us could have anticipated. And as long as we're talking about this, like, I would, I would you know, I would just like to encourage, if you'd like to annoy people, call your congressmen and senators, because I know they just let it go to voicemail now, but, like, they do actually have to listen to all of your voice messages and even if you can waste someone's time, I think like there is a certain amount of pressure that can be brought to bear on Democratic politicians right now. That like, look, I'm not optimistic about it, but like at least you can ruin someone's day. Yeah, and sometimes spite is all we have. Yeah, because the thing is like it, it like this is this is becoming increasingly untenable for the Democratic Party to continue to go along with this. And look, they are so. going to continue think, to do so, but it's becoming very, very tenuous. They're running out of goodwill. These, these, these. This country is becoming more problem than it's worth. And like it's becoming a pain in our ass. And it was much easier when it was just sort of like a passive thing that we didn't have to pay attention to. I mean, it's just like one of the ways that I don't know, it 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 does differ from like South African apartheid is that like, you know, they had like wine and diamonds we wanted. Like, what the fuck do we, we'd be fine without it. I could, I'd have got Google Maps. I don't need Waze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love when they bring up Waze. Waze. Like, who fucking Waze. uses that? Who gives that? a shit? Yeah. yeah. Oh my I think, fucking I think, God. like, the biotech thing, like, I think they might have, like, kind of a good, but I think it's just manufacturing. I don't think they invest, like, a whole lot in, like, pharmaceutical research. I think they're just no, like, I mean, hey, they're, let's they're, do they're, they're investing in startups to prolong life so that that guy and his son can suck each other's dicks for <laughs> the next thousand years. <laughs> I mean, you, you talked about how, like, there, you know, there are fissures showing, you know, inside the Democratic Party and how this is increasingly untenable. I thought it was notable how Macron, like, kind of broke with his previous stance on this. And it's like, obviously, no one is confused and thinks he has like a conscience, but he, like a lot of other people are realizing more trouble. Than it's, worth. This is, it's like, it's you, this is just like untenable. You can't treat this like a normal country. Like it's yeah. going to fuck up everything else for you. And also, um, I, an another thing I've noticed this week is like instructions going out to be like, when you're defending Israel, do not bring up the history of Israel. Cause like, that's a battle we can only <laughs> lose. <laughs> And, and what I think is like in these narratives, first rule of Zionism, do not talk about yeah. Zionism. <laughs> yeah. No, initially in the defenses of Israel, you would get these long these stem winders about how, oh, like the Nakba didn't really exist or they left voluntarily or just all this stuff about oh how we've been attacked so many times. And like this litany of historical facts that like previously, I think people were just sort of like, this shit's boring. I don't care. And they tune it out and accept it as true. But the insistence on uh, d like the, discussing the history of the foundation of Israel and, and its continued existence is like the more people become aware of that, the wor like the, the worse a playing field that they have to, 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 to work with. Yeah. Well, and also like nobody wants to fucking read all that shit. Like I've, I've been sent like, uh, like a bunch of petitions to sign and they're like a page and a half long. And it's like, man, I don't even want to read that. Like, first of all, like, uh, I think my record on how I feel about the occupation has been pretty clear given given my career, if that's what you could call podcasting. Second of all, like it's they're doing, I think, kind of the same thing where they're trying to inundate people with information and tell like right. the real story to counteract the revisionism. And I think that's the wrong move. I think that first of all, keep the messaging as like condensed as possible also you're going to get like a ton of criticism like from the left or whatever at the same time too if you sign it because they're like why are you calling it an occupation and not a genocide it's like shut the fuck up like it's just it's very it's very annoying when you're trying to be given when someone is trying to give you a whole bunch of information to sort out the real story 
And isn't like, isn't Rashomon like a three hour movie? Like, I, it's just the way to go is to keep your messaging simple. And I think Israel's really like hanging itself with like this barrage of, of, you know, of insisting upon themselves with like, you know, these You're, PR fucking like, uh, Amber, uh, that stories. Yeah. The, and that's exactly right because the message that they have to counteract, which is the message embraced by most of the people on the world who are aware of it is ceasefire. Now that's a very simple message. Yeah. Stop yeah. the bombing I, and the occupation. And then to, to argue against that, from the Israeli perspective, requires this like Jenga set of fucking like contradictory <laughs> half truths yeah. and, and outright falsehoods. The longer you talk, the more people are going to feel like you're lying. Like the one of the reasons like the, the Bernie petition had such impact because it was just like three sentences. Like I like Bernie and I'm voting for him. And people were like, cool, I will. I, I'll read and sign that. But it's like, man, if I don't want to read it, Nobody else wants to just like give them enough rope. Let them talk as much as they want to. Like it, they're losing credibility as it is. They have, you know, as as Trump has correctly observed, they're, they're having bad optics. They're losing favor just broadly with the American public. Not that what the American public wants, not that popular will has much influence, if any, on, you know, actual political policy, especially foreign policy. But like, I don't know, just just. Just don't talk about it. Just be like, hey, this is the occupation is bad and mean. These are it's mean. It's a bad it's a bad guy. And then just let let Israel have a fucking PR meltdown. Let them trot out the guy with the dumbest name and stupidest accent in the world. Yeah, just get a Capri pants guy out there. And people are like, you know what? I just don't I don't. I don't trust this guy. All right, I think that's a, a good place to wrap things up here. But uh, before we take off today, uh, Chris has an important announcement for you guys. Hello. I pitched this on uh, Thursday's show, but this one's available for the public. Uh, so some of people listening might not necessarily be subscribers to the Chapo Trap House Patreon. Hell, we never even mentioned the Patreon on uh, public shows, so some of you might not even know we have one. Uh, but Yeah, subscribe now if you haven't done so. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> We are, we are awful at plugging, but we have good news over there on the content front, which is that we are releasing Hell of Presidents, the uh, American history series I did with Matt two years ago on Stitcher. We are putting that on to the Patreon, uh, and so we will be releasing those uh, over the next few weeks. I haven't decided if I'm going to put out one episode a week or two episodes a week over the next either 10 or 18 weeks, whatever, but that's free for subscribers now. Hell of Presidents on the Patreon. Also... Patreon has a digital shop feature that they are revving up, uh, and I have made all of our mini series this year available on uh, the digital shop. Uh, so even if you are not a subscriber, you can just buy Hell on Earth, Matt and I's History of the 17th Century, or either of the two series of movie mindset that Will and Hessa did this year. All those are on patreon.com slash chapotraphouse slash shop, I believe is the URL. Uh, and yeah, again, if you're not a subscriber, you can just pick those things up. They make uh, you know good digital gifts or you, if you just want to own them. That is my plug. Uh, big things happening over on patreon.com slash chapotraphouse. Cool. All right. Uh, Till next time, everybody. See ya. <laughs>